wanted to point out, like, if astrobiology is successful, what we're actually going to accomplish, which is adding a new cosmological parameter to our understanding of the universe, which I think effectively Eddie was trying to get at by expanding our horizons and thinking beyond the solar system. Um, but I think it's um, really important to kind of understand the context of our science in, in terms of the scope of what has been accomplished in the past as far as our understanding of the natural world and where we're going. And so um, the way I think about astrobiology really is in terms of a probabilistic framework about what is the percentage of living matter that the universe actually can support and can we constrain that as astrobiologists and how will we do that quantitatively. And so this is trying to move into quantitative frameworks for astrobiology and thinking more about astrobiology as a quantitative science and a theoretically driven science um, than one just based on sort of um, anthropic perspectives that we have about life on Earth. And so there's a long tradition, obviously, of people asking the question, what is life, and trying to think about it from a definitional perspective, particularly in our field. And that's gotten us really far. Um, but I think that we really need to challenge ourselves at this stage in astrobiology to really think about what life is, but not from a definitional framework, but from a quantitative one. And so there's a lot of people that have quoted Orton Schrodinger over the years as far as his framework for what is life and thinking about that. Um, but my favorite part of that book is absolutely the, one of the last things he says in the book about a plea for other laws of physics, that there's really something missing from our understanding of the way the world works um, and how we can actually understand ourselves um, in terms of new principles or laws that are actually necessary to explain life. So what astrobiology really needs to get at the question, what is life, is to really start thinking about quantitative approaches and not just definitions, but ways that we can actually quantify biosignatures in the way that have been presented so far, but also combining that with new ways of trying to understand what life is fundamentally, and then unifying how we think about that, not just from the perspective of biosignatures, but how we think about it for origin science or across all of the astrobiology disciplines. So the question, what is life, is obviously really hard. But there are some things life does that no other physical processes in the universe do. Right? So we don't know of any other kind of physical process that can launch satellites into space. Right? So this process of anti-accretion that David Grinspoon has been talking about is a biological process. It's an interesting process in that it actually requires information. It requires technological civilization like our own that has some sort of knowledge in it. And so to me, that's suggestive of what life is and actually informs kind of new principles. The same thing with thinking about um, certain elements in the periodic table that couldn't be pr produced without technology. Right? But technology is not usually thought of as a physical process. We don't think about intelligence as a physical thing. We don't think about it as something to be discovered in the universe. But that's really what the, the mission of astrobiology is. Um, so obviously, in biosignature science, we've been doing this for quite a while. We've been thinking, what are the signatures? What are the things that we think biology can uniquely produce? And so really what we've been doing in astrobiology right along is reframing the question from what is life to what does life do and what does life produce? And I think we're at a stage with asking that question that we can really not just think about what does life do as a biosignature, as the signatures of known life, but also use the new frameworks that people have been talking about in the session so far and that we're going to hear about all week to think about reframing the question of what life is itself. And I'm going to give a couple examples of that later in my talk. So um, we've obviously been thinking about this question, how do we search for life in terms of what does life produce? Um, and Eddie already introduced this series of papers that came out last year on exoplanet biosignatures. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more from this quantitative framework perspective. So when we're thinking about what life produces, there's always the problem of the fact that some things life produces can be produced by non-living processes. So we can be fooled. And so um, it can absolutely fool us. And we know this really clearly now from all the examples of false positive biosignatures that we have. And so Eddie walked through um, some really nice examples of that. But one of the things a quantitative framework allows us to do is not say that this thing is absolutely indicative of life and this one is not indicative of life. We need to think about this thing as having a statistical likelihood of being produced by life that's higher than the likelihood of it not being produced by life. And so this is the motivation for thinking statistically, that in order to tweeze out the certainty that something is actually a biological process, we have to acknowledge the fact that biology can't do anything that physics and chemistry can't do. Unless you get to a technological civilization, you require extra information and intelligence. When we're talking about small molecule biosignatures, physics and chemistry alone can produce most of those. So we have to understand what is it that biology does above and beyond that, and how do we actually quantify that? So if we're thinking about these things, it's not just the constraints from the fact that we have false positives, that a dead planet can fool us, but we also have another set of constraints that's really hard, is that our observational constraints. Especially with exoplanets, this issue is critical because we get very limited data and we don't even have certainty of what we're measuring. 
right? We have statistical models that might produce a given observable, and we might have some likelihood that that observable is consistent with our framework. And so we need to really move to not just thinking statistically about biosignatures for biosignature's sake, but also in terms of observational constraints. And so a number of us um, got together as part of this nexus in initiative to try to think quantitatively about biosignatures and came up with a Bayesian framework for life detection. Um, there's a lot of different statistical methods you could use to think about detecting life, but this is just one of them. And so um, the basic idea is that we really need to think about astrobiology from a more unified approach and try to think about how do we actually say with a co high confidence level, as Sarah was indicating, that we have detected life rather than not life which means we need a conditional probability of life being produced from that particular set of observational data. Now, the confounding factor is that a certain set of data might also be produced abiotically. So we have a probability that the same observational data might be produced by a non-living process. And so if you really want to have something that's a very detectable biosignature or technosignature, it needs to be something where the probability that it was created by life is higher than the probability it was created by not life. And so what we need to do as a community is try to figure out what are those things, what are those observables that give us high confidence that we're actually looking at a sample of life. And the interesting thing about this framework is that it doesn't matter if we're looking at a biosignature about morphology or a biosignature about chemistry, they can all go into the same quantitative framework. And so we really need to think about all the observables, as Dave was saying, that we possibly can gather to increase the likelihood that the particular observation was produced by life and not a non-living process. So I want to go back to this idea of thinking about how we're actually constraining the probability of life. So one of the problems is that we don't have an a priori probability. We don't actually know what the likelihood of life in the universe is. All right, so I think, I think this is something that in the astrobiology community we don't think about enough because we like to make wild speculation that life is common or that life is um, you know, going to look like us. But the truth of the matter is we don't know. We don't know if we're the only life in the universe. And that's actually empowering to us as an astrobiology community if we think about that from the proper perspective of the fact that we really need to think very rigorously about this problem because we don't know what we're looking for. We don't know what life is going to be like on other worlds. We don't even know if it exists. And so we need to start bounding what we think the likelihood of the process is, what we think that thing is, and trying to think about it from all sides. Um, so one way I like to think about astrobiology is that it's not like we really have subdisciplines that are tackling separate problems. So we have people that do SETI that are looking for intelligent life. We have people that do origins of life research. But really, all of us are kind of interested in this common understanding of what life is in the universe and how we can actually understand if we're alone. Um, and I think that if we actually try to unify our perspectives a little bit more, that we actually can make more meaningful progress. And so you can think about it from the perspective of looking for another example of life. That's one way of constraining the likelihood or the understanding the probabilities for life. So for example, if we do have a statistical ensemble of exoplanets, and we don't know if there's actually life on any of those worlds, but we have some confidence that life might be on those worlds, we don't know which world, that actually constrains the probability for life existing in the universe in a way that we don't know now, and gives us some in knowledge and information on the planetary context in which life is actually likely to emerge. From the other side, if we start trying to make life in the lab under conditions of early Earth, but just expanding their horizons and thinking of alternative chemistries for life in the lab, or alternative chemical contexts for life, we start to actually think about the principles that underlie life. That can actually inform the probability of life from the other perspective. And so one thing I think is really interesting thinking about biosignature science in this kind of quantitative perspective is that it starts to get biosignatures more intimately related to other areas of astrobiology. And one of the ones I like to think about a lot is origins of life. In the fact that if we had a real theory, a real quantitative framework for the origins of life, we would actually have a predictive framework for thinking about life on other worlds, which is not something that we have right now. But this is really going to require a merger of theory and experiment in a way astrobiologists haven't been able to accomplish before. And I think we're on that horizon. So this actually um, image came out of a work workshop at Carnegie a couple years ago on reconceptualizing the origins of life, which was to the point of trying to think about merging theory and experiment in a more meaningful way. And I'll just give you an example of what that might look like. You can think about the fact that a lot of the kinds of chemistry that people are doing now in origins of life is moving towards sort of quote unquote messy chemistry approaches, thinking statistically about the chemistry that might have given rise to life. And so if you think about the fact that you have some kind of messy chemical soup, and this experiment came from Lee Cronin's lab, 
um, you can actually think about whether you could actually distinguish a chemical system from another chemical system based on its history. This is not even talking about life, but you can actually talk about the historical context of like the different minerals and things that were added to the chemistry and start to say that you actually can distinguish chemistries based on their history. Now think about that in a planetary context. Imagine you're doing these kind of origins of life experiments, but you're actually looking at the diversity of planets that we have from other areas of astrobiology environments that we know about origins of life. It gives us some constraints on what kind of chemistries and complexity of the chemistry we should expect on those worlds. We don't have any large-scale experiments in astrobiology. This experiment I'm showing on this slide is something from the particle physics community, it's Super Kamiokande, which is a neutrino physics experiment. This experiment is designed to bound the proton decay rate. So if you think about proton decay, it's never been observed. So we have an experiment that's basically trying to look for something that we don't know physically exists. It's motivated by theory. We have some theories that predict that process might exist in the universe. And what we're doing with this experiment is we built a large volume of water to look for proton decay. And every time we don't observe the event, we have a bound on the probability of that event happening in the universe. Imagine if we did this with an origin of life experiment, right? And we actually took those kind of ensemble statistic approaches to thinking about messy chemistries and their likelihood for life, didn't constrain them by our anthropocentric biases about what we think life is, and let chemistry do what it does on planets in the lab. And we bound the process. We at least can look at the probability. We can connect origins of life science to exoplanet science, and we can find ways of thinking quantitatively about biosignatures in those experiments. The main point of this is that our experiments, both in observations in terms of how we're doing observations now with exoplanets, they're, they're based on likelihoods that we think that, you know, this is the most likely observation. They have statistical errors associated, both experimental and the fact that we're just constrained in the limited data that we can take. And the experiments that we're doing in the lab now for origins of life, at least the most cutting edge ones from my perspective, they're all statistical. So what we need to do is build statistical frameworks for biosignatures. We have a statistical framework for assessing the likelihood of life, and now building into that framework, we need to think more statistically about the biosignatures that we're actually developing and use them to motivate more understanding of what we're thinking about as far as life, what life is. And so one way to think about this that might be more familiar to most people in this room is just to acknowledge the fact that life is an emergent property. Right? Nobody in this room has individual atoms that are alive, but we're all alive as sort of collections of atoms that are interacting, molecules interacting. So the quantitative observables of you as a living entity, to talk about how alive you are, must be things that are emergent properties. They have to be statistical in nature. Life is a statistical phenomena. It's a macro scale phenomena. So we need to think about it from that perspective, and we need to start developing biosignatures that really quantify that. I think one of the things, um, and I think Sarah touched on this a little bit, is not to think about something as measuring, you know, this thing's life or this thing's no life but you can assign a likelihood to it being life. And actually, it's not even quite that that's the most interesting thing about it. It's actually that you could talk about how alive a system is. Some systems are just more alive than others. This is like the nature of the origin life transition. It didn't go from non-life to life. There are a gradation of stages in between. And so we need to figure out how to quantify those stages. We need to understand how we can actually measure it. So one of the things um, that my group's been doing is actually thinking about something called plant, we're calling nominally planetary systems biochemistry, to, but really think about life at a planetary scale and using all of the data that we have across biochemistry on Earth to really understand what the statistical properties of biochemistry are. And so this necessitates kind of going to an abstract approach. So we can look at planet Earth and we can necessarily see it's alive because we have some subjective notion of what we think life is. But the whole point of astrobiology is if we look at another world, it might be alive and we might look at it and we might not recognize it. So we actually have to look at the patterns and the data and understand what it is about that system that's alive. And I think that those things are necessarily gonna be some kind of abstract mathematical principle. And the only example I can give you that really like resonates for me is just to think about the fact that we're all bound to the planet right now by gravity, right? Is anybody not bound by gravity? Okay, good, all right. So we all obey the laws of physics, right? But you don't intuitively, obviously, think about the fact that you're sitting in your chair right now and not floating off into space because the space around you is curved, right? It's because of the curvature in space and time. That's a pretty abstract concept. And I think when we're looking at life, we have to think in similar levels of abstraction. And so one of the ways that we've been doing it to quantify it is to actually think in terms of network properties. A network is a really nice representation because it allows you to talk about the statistical properties of a system as it's organized. And so in this particular network that I'm showing here, this is a network representation of the biosphere. What we mean by that is this is all of the biochemistry that's known. 
that's cataloged in the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. Um, and each, each node in the network is a molecule, and it's connected to by other molecules if it participates in a common reaction. You can be part of a social network in the sense that all of you could be nodes in a social network like on Twitter, if anybody's tweeting right now, and you could be connected by other people by liking them. That allows you just to study statistical regularities in that system. It allows you to study some of the emergent properties in terms of the organization. And so one of the things that we've been able to show is that if you look at biochemistry on planet Earth, it is statistically very regular. It has very regular network properties. In terms of the fact, if you look at networks of what reactions an individual organism catalyzes, an ecosystem catalyzes, or the planet as a, a living entity, as a biosphere catalyzes, they have the same structural properties in terms of their network representation that scale as a function of the number of compounds. And it's different than random chemistry. Now, the point of this in terms of a statistical framework is that once you know what those kind of scaling relations are, you have a quantitative rule, you can actually start talking about statistically distinguishing systems. So if one thing we've been able to show is if you just look at the patterns and the reactions in a network, you can statistically distinguish an archaea from a bacteria. You don't need to know anything about the chemistry they're doing. You just need to know about the patterns, the statistical patterns and the correlation of how the molecules are interacting. If you're talking about agnostic biosignatures and you want to build quantitative frameworks for not only looking for life on other worlds, but quantifiably predicting what that life might look like, if you have a set of statistical constraints, you can start to think about building machine learning algorithms for constructing chemistries with alternative chemistries, but the same sets of constraints. And so what we're really looking for are what are the statistical regularities across life on Earth and how do we actually quantify them and then build predictive models for astrobiology. Another kind of measure you might use um, is to think about biomolecular chirality. Now, usually we think about this also, as we do with life, as a black or white issue. It's either homochiral or it's not. But if you actually look at the statistical patterns and chirality across the biosphere, it's a much more complex story. Um, so what's shown in this network representation, and Hanju Kim is giving a talk on this work later today, um, is the biosphere level network now looking for statistical patterns and whether a molecule is chiral or achiral. Now, if you have a chiral molecule, it's not just whether it's left-handed or right-handed, but how many chiral centers it has. It's a very complex problem. But you can actually start to look at statistical regularities and build predictive frameworks for how, how biology is actually using chirality to architect biochemical networks. And maybe there might be some universal rules underlying that. I need to speed up. So pathway assembly and thinking about probabilistic biosignatures has also been discussed already. The only point I'm going to make about this um, with what Lee Cronin is doing is that it actually connects to theoretical frameworks, because not only do you have a way of thresholding for biology, but you have a way of thinking about what biology is doing in chemical space, which allows us to think about building quantitative theory and predictive frameworks for other chemistries. You can do the same thing with thinking about life on other planets, and so this is um, Harrison Smith's poster that's going to be presented later, thinking about how could you actually predict what biochemistry might look like on other worlds. And it also leads to statistical characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. And so one of the things that we've been doing is taking this idea of taking observational uncertainties and building statistical models for how you might think about what's detectable and what's actually going to quantify the differences in planets that are alive or not. Again, using this kind of network-based approach, and I'm just going to make a nod to Tessa Fisher's talk later this week about statistical characterization of Jovian atmospheres based on the network structure of the planetary atmosphere and how you can actually start to think about system-level organizational planets from a quantitative framework and talk about the quantitatively the differences. Um, so just to go back to the Bayesian framework, I think the thing that's really important for us to start thinking about is how we're actually building our approaches together for a common goal and how we can put this into quantitative frameworks that are really going to bring astrobiology into the next decades where we actually can talk about statistical confidence levels in what the likelihood of life is in the universe. And with that, I'm just going to thank my group because they're pretty awesome and all of you. Thank you.